I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. August 2020 marks the centennial of the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote nationally. In this Q&A program, journalist Elaine Weiss, author of The Woman's Hour, discusses the 70-year effort to attain suffrage and some of the people who risk their reputations and sometimes even their lives to change our Constitution and advance this basic right. Elaine Weiss, I want to start our conversation on the centennial of women's suffrage with a clip of someone whose story you tell in your book, The Woman's Hour, Harry T. Byrne. Let's listen to him from a Nashville public TV documentary in 2019, and then we'll come back and talk about him. My mother was a college woman. She was a student of national and international affairs. She took an interest in all public issues. She could not vote. And yet the tenant farmers on our farm, some of whom were illiterate, could vote. Who was Harry Byrne and why does he play a central role in your story? Ah, Harry Thomas Byrne was the youngest legislator in the Tennessee General Assembly in 1920. He was a freshman delegate and he was up for re-election in the fall. And he represented the small hill town of Nyota in East Tennessee, which was the Republican part of Tennessee. And he, although he um, uh, voted with the anti-suffragists and the anti-ratificationists when the 19th Amendment was up for ratification in the Tennessee General Assembly that summer, he changed his mind because of a letter he received from his mother, who he describes in that clip. And that change of mind uh, tilted the vote by one vote. And that's how the 19th Amendment was finally ratified. How did the vote for ratification of the Constitutional Amendment come down to Tennessee? Uh, A convoluted path. The um, Constitution um, says that uh, new amendments have to be passed by Congress by a two thirds vote in each uh, chamber. And then it has to be ratified by three quarters of the states in the union. So at that time there were 48 states, which meant 36 had to ratify. And in the summer of 1920, 35 had ratified. So you had just one more state was needed for full ratification. It would enter the constitution and American women in every state would be able to vote in the 1920 elections. And that was a presidential year. It's a really pivotal election. And it turned out that Tennessee was the last possible choice for a place, uh, for a state to ratify. Um, Most of the other states in the South had actually rejected, already rejected the 19th Amendment. And there were a few outstanding states, but um, two of them were New England, Connecticut and Vermont. The governors there refused to call their legislatures back into special session, which is what it would have um, required because the legislature was not in session at that time. And they refused. They were under uh, corporate pressure from uh, their, their corporate interests who played a a big role in their political lives. So they refused. Um, There were two southern states still not heard from, North Carolina, which everyone knew was going to not ratify, and Florida, same thing. And so Tennessee was the only one left. It was still a dangerous place to stage this uh, probably final battle for women's suffrage uh, at the constitutional level. And the suffragists were not happy about having to uh, stage this to fight for for the last state in a southern state because that makes it much more complicated for reasons I'm sure we'll discuss. And um, so it was a very difficult uh, realization that Tennessee was the one, uh, but they had to deal with it. And of course, for the anti-suffragists, the anti-ratificationists, it also was something of a last stand. So the governor of Tennessee wanted to duck. He didn't want it here, um, there. (laughs) The Tennessee legislature did not want to be the deciding factor 
And so you had a lot of um, powers trying to um, make Tennessee not have to be in this pivotal position, but it turned out it was. So if Tennessee had failed to ratify, what would have happened to women's suffrage? Well, that's an interesting speculation, because as I said, uh, there were two northern states still in play, but the governors had totally refused, completely refused to uh, call their legislatures back. And they probably would not have done that before the 1920 election. What the suffragists sensed, and I think they were very correct in this, is that the nation was swinging towards a much more um, conservative frame of mind. The progressive era was over. We had just emerged from a very unpopular war, the, the Great War, World War I. And the nation was um, swinging away from that idea of, the, of America being uh, the beacon of, of the free world. It was going into a more isolationist position. There were um, a lot of domestic problems that were having to be decided. So this was a pivotal, pivotal election. And the suffragists felt if they could not get Tennessee to ratify, the momentum would be lost. In fact, the momentum in the spring had been against them. There had been several um, rejections, including moderate Delaware. Delaware rejected the 19th Amendment. And so they were really nervous that if they couldn't resolve this, this ratification in Tennessee in the summer of 1920, they were not perhaps going to see it ratified in their lifetimes or for the foreseeable future. Because what they feared is that once the election was passed, that sense of pressure from the political establishment would be over. And the nation was having second thoughts. There were actually uh, several states that wanted to rescind their prior ratification of the 19th Amendment and also was being challenged in court. So they just felt, and I think they were very correct, that if they couldn't get it done now, it was not going to happen. And those of us who have lived through the vicissitudes of the Equal Rights Amendment, which was the successor, meant as the successor amendment to the 19th, and it was introduced into Congress in 1923, know that a, an amendment can come very close to the finish line, as the ERA has, and yet not make it into the Constitution. So I think their fears were well-founded. By 1920, how many states allowed women to vote? Um, I believe about 12 or 15 states allowed for what was called full suffrage. So you have to understand it gets kind of complicated in our federalist system. The Constitution provides that the states are in charge of voting um, requirements for their citizens and also for administration of elections. We know that because that's why there's such a uh, hodgepodge of <clears throat> election law today, because the states are in charge and they can make those decisions. So you can um, uh, get the right to vote by two paths. One is your state gives it to you by a change in the Constitution, uh, a change in um, in in the fundamental laws of voting in that state. And the other is through a constitutional amendment, which would supersede all the state uh, requirements and give the vote in one fell swoop to, to all women in every state. And so the suffragists had pursued a, a double track, shall we say, from the beginning. They worked in the states in referenda, um, in which men, of course, were the only people who could vote whether women deserved the vote. So you had scores of referenda in many, many states, and they would try again and try again uh, several times. And sometimes it took five or six times. Sometimes it failed and, and was never revived. And so by that time, about 15 states, most of them in the West, but uh, pivotally, Illinois had given women the vote in 1917, I believe, and New York also in 1917. I may be wrong on the Illinois one. Um, but so there were just a few outposts of Midwestern and Western, uh, pardon, and Eastern states. The Northeast Corridor was very, very reluctant to, uh, about women's suffrage. And so they had managed through enormous effort 
to get a, these 15 states to allow women to vote. Again, it, it, this starts in the Western states, which are not very populated, Wyoming, Idaho, Colorado, um, then goes up through California, Oregon, Washington. And um, so you have, when New York uh, allows suffrage in 1917, that's a big milestone. That's when things begin to move again because it's the most populous state. And then the politicians can't ignore women's suffrage anymore. So you have um, these 15 states where women can vote. And then you have several other states uh, post-World War I, so just in the last year or two previous, who gave women the right to vote in presidential elections. Not in, they couldn't vote for their governor, their senator, their congressman, but they could vote for president. So now you have quite a few women who can vote in the presidential election, even if they don't have full suffrage. So the politicians have to pay a little more attention uh, to to the will of, of, the, of the women uh, electorate. And so you see a different um, calculation in their minds in 1920. Could you describe um, just a bit about the standing of women, the legal standing of women in American society at this period? Well, um, it's best to go back to uh, into the 19th century when the movement begins. And at that time, uh, the, the idea of women's legal rights uh, is almost an oxymoron because there are so they have so few rights. A woman could not own her own property if she was married. Everything belonged to her husband. If uh, her husband died, it often went to his brother. And and so his brother, her brother-in-law, would now be in charge of everything she owned. Uh, A woman did not have custodial rights over her children. So if she left the marriage for any reason, she could not um, take have custody of the children. They belonged to her husband. A woman could not um, keep her own wages, her own inheritance. Again, all those property rights reverts to a husband. She could not testify in a court of law. She could not bring civil suit in her own name. She could not serve on a jury. And of course, she couldn't vote. She couldn't enter most colleges or universities. Most um, occupations and professions were closed to her. So this is what, uh, this kind of outrage at this is what stimulates the women's rights movement in the mid 19th century. Coming to 1920, some of those property laws, which are state laws, have been uh, improved. Uh, Not all, but some have been improved. So women can uh, claim their own property in certain states. Of course, some the women's colleges have opened, so women have more access to um, higher education and and, and some uh, state universities are open to women. A few professions are letting a few women in. It's still very, very, as we know, that won't change until the 1970s. And so um, you see a very small changes, uh, important, but they're, they're haphazard and they're also um, very hard fought. I mean, women fight for decades to make these changes. And that's one of the reasons that they want the vote. The, the movement begins as a women's rights movement, and they uh, are asking for a lot of changes. It begins to uh, narrow its focus into suffrage or the right to vote as the sort of turnkey. This is what women, if women have representation in the places where policy and laws are being made, well, then maybe they can change those laws through the legal system. So that's why suffrage becomes the leading edge of this women's rights movement. And then following, Alice Paul says, okay, we have the vote. Now we are going to, uh, we want to make sure we're leveling the playing field in all those other aspects of uh, women's legal rights. And that's where the Equal Rights Amendment uh, comes in. The two sides were nicknamed the Suffs and the Antis. I've heard uh, through your explanation what the arguments were for the suffs. What were the arguments the antis had against women's suffrage? Well, yes, there there are several uh, varieties of anti-suffragists. The one that comes most easily to mind, of course, is men. 
Um, and so we think, well, you know, there's reasons men might not want women to vote. One is that they'd have to share power. That's the most basic one. Um, if women can vote, then they are half the electorate. And men's power is diluted. And so that's certainly a political uh, argument. Men also uh, were very nervous about upsetting the political status quo and uh, whether uh, men who were running for office were very nervous about having to appeal to women, women voters. It was sort of a different uh, persona they might have to project. And they're even worried about you know, what they look like which they never had to do when they were just appealing to men. But then you have the more interesting um, anti-suffrage and then anti-ratification uh, antis who were women. The fact that there were organized groups of women who opposed women's suffrage was really kind of shocking to me when I first encountered it in my research. But they were, they were not as numerous in 1920 you know, back in the late 19th century, you didn't have to have an anti-suffrage movement because most people were anti-suffrage. The suffragists were a, a kind of minor fringe group uh, of women. They were considered radicals. They were derided as uh, unpatriotic and um, deranged and zealots. So the idea of, of organizing to oppose suffrage doesn't really become a reality till around 1911 when the suffrage movement's beginning to make some traction. And so people, even women, get worried about this. Why would women oppose their sisters getting the vote? A variety of reasons. One is many of these re women antis are political, cultural, um, religious conservative women. And they truly believe that this is going to upset gender roles. And it's going to destroy the American family if women have a sense of equality. And there's all kinds of anti-suffrage propaganda uh, materials that show women abandoning their families to work for suffrage. And it shows a woman leaving, going out the, the family home door, leaving dad with the screaming babies or having to do the wash on a, a washboard. And of course, this you know, symbolizes the fall of civilization. And the idea that this is going to affect your private life, it's not just a political issue, because this wasn't just a political issue. It really was a questioning of women's rights and women's role in society. So this is what makes it a much more complicated issue. And if you can say women are equal, they have an equal vote and an equal voice to men. Well, then what does that mean in the home? And this, the anti-suffragists are very uh, concerned that this means that men are going to be emasculated and women are going to become more masculine. And uh, this was dangerous for the family. So they really see this as the downfall of um, civilization and moral society. They also, for those who are religious conservatives, they use the Bible. They say this is against God's plan. Uh, God, as they uh, interpret it, made uh, Adam to be dominant over Eve. And to question that by saying that women should have political equality is to question God's plan. And they use biblical arguments against the idea of suffrage. And you see that um, over and over again where they say God does not want this. And of course, we hear echoes of that today in, in many uh, uh, debates about social change. So you have this constellation of men and women who are very afraid and very opposed to the idea of women getting the vote. And there are some notable intellectuals uh, who are women who are actually against women's suffrage. The mid-19th century's uh, centerpiece was, of course, the Seneca Falls Conference, uh, 1848. Three names that everyone knows from their history books, uh, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Frederick Douglass. You write in your book that these three people's extraordinary 50-year partnership changed the course of our history. What's important for people to know about how the three of them work together to advance rights in our society? Well, you're very right. I find I, I would say that 
um, they are uh, very important names. I'll just make one small correction, which uh, is often, I, I didn't know this until I had to delve into it. Um, Frederick Douglass is at the Seneca Falls meeting in 1848. Uh, Susan Anthony is not. Susan Anthony joins the movement a few years later. She is working as a temperance, she's actually a teacher, and she's working in temperance and in abolition. The three, uh, those three notables come together through the abolition movement. And that's a really important thing for us to understand that the women's rights movement, the women's suffrage movement, is a direct um, uh, outgrowth of the abolition movement. And the women we think of as the foremothers, Elizabeth Stanton, Susan Anthony, Lucretia Ma, Lucy Stone, were actually abolition workers, very active abolition workers before their suffrage workers. And the idea of uh, all human beings having the divine spark, having the rights to, to of freedom, and in a democracy, the rights of a voice in their government comes out of the kind of central tenet of, uh, of abolitionism, that, that no human should be property, no human should be a slave. And women realize that in some ways, not to make the, a direct connection between um, women's oppression and slavery at that time, but women have very few rights. And so they see this connection of uh, there's something very wrong in our society and they band together. And so you have these women for 20 years working uh, very hard in the abolition movement and also beginning to, to start speaking about women's rights. And the fact that um, Frederick Douglass was at Seneca Falls was, and again, I did not know this before I started my research, was just startling and ex extraordinary to me. Now, it was no coincidence he didn't just happen to pass by. He lived about 50 miles away in Rochester. Um, he was supported by uh, abolitionists, especially abolitionist women. He was publishing the, the North Star, his abolitionist newspaper there. And he had worked with Elizabeth Stanton and she invited him to come. So when she presents her Declaration of Rights and Sentiments, which bas basically uh, is a lament of all the reasons why women are oppressed. And it, it's a direct um, echo of the Declaration of Independence. She uses Jefferson's language. And then she has resolutions to uh, solve these problems. And one of them, the ninth resolution, is the idea of the vote. And that is considered so radical and so um, unattainable that even her fellow reformers who are at this Seneca Falls meeting say, please, don't, don't put that on the table. It's really too radical. It'll make us seem ridiculous. And they ask her to take it off the agenda, and she refuses. And it's Frederick Douglass who stands up and says, you must, you must uh, demand this. You must demand the vote. It's not going to be given to you, just as it's not going to be given to me as a black man, unless we are willing to fight for it. And it's Frederick Douglass who convinces the other very reluctant uh, participants at Seneca Falls to sign on to this resolution number nine and approve it. And I think we would possibly never have heard of Seneca Falls if it wasn't for, for um, Frederick Douglass convincing the others to pass it. And he calls himself a woman's rights man for the rest of his life. And he truly, truly is. He's, in my mind, the hero, one of the great heroes of this story because he believes in universal suffrage. And so he will be fighting for universal suffrage, all adult citizens. What will happen is there'll be a, a great disappointment after the Civil War in the Reconstruction period and the Reconstruction Amendments, the 14th and the 15th Amendments. And the, basically Congress says, oh yeah, I know you were all expecting to get the vote, but the nation can't handle two big reforms at once. So it's either going to be black men get the vote or women get the vote. It can't be both. And black men need it more um, element, 
hastily because there's horrible violence and lynchings going on. And so they need the vote to protect themselves. And so it's a terrible rift and both um, uh, Frederick Douglass has to tell them the woman's hour has not come. You, it will come eventually, but you will have to wait. And there, and this produces a schism uh, that takes quite a while to heal. And so race is part of this story from the very beginning, from the abolitionists to the split after in the reconstruction period, when the women are betrayed, they really are betrayed. Um, and so they get very angry. They, uh, Anthony and Stanton say vile racist things. The friendship with Douglas is repaired um, between them, the personal one. And he, he still attends women's rights conventions to the rest for the rest of his life. In fact, he dies in 1895, just a few hours after attending a women's rights convention in Washington. And so the idea that he truly, truly believed in, in women's rights is, is borne out. And it's, it's actually a, a, a beautiful story. Um, and he maintains that even when he is betrayed himself by the suffragists. So it seems as though phase two of this, after the the um, the Fourteenth and Fifteenth Amendments were passed, really began in the late eighteen seventies, early eighteen eighties. Uh, first legislation went to Congress in eighteen seventy eight. What was its fate? Well, there were there were actually a couple of attempts before that uh, in the House and in the Senate, um, it, and those didn't go far at all. And finally. Um, in 1878, Stanton and Anthony work with their friends in Congress, and they they get it actually introduced. And it is stalled there for the next 40 years, 40 years. Every year, the suffragists go up and uh, testify be- before whatever House or Senate committee is hearing at that time. And they give their very well constructed legal arguments. And um, Elizabeth Stanton used to say that she'd be giving her, and she had a great legal mind, and she'd be giving this testimony. And the uh, chairman and the other members of the committee would be eating their lunch, reading the newspaper, clipping their nails, doing anything but but listening to the women. And she said it some point in her memoir, she said she had to restrain herself from throwing her manuscript at their heads. She was so angry that they were not listening. So this gets thrown back into the uh, file cabinet every year for 40 years. And it's not until after World War I that it finally emerges. Um, And uh, even that is really hard. It passes... The House, again, it has to be a two-thirds majority. It passes the House by a margin very small. It passes the Senate with only two-vote margin. Um, it's There are senators who are sitting on it. Um, after The House passes it, actually, in 1918, and it, and it takes until June of 1919 before it passes the uh, both houses. And then the Senate knew that they were sending it out for ratification in the states, what's called an off year when most um, state legislatures were not going to be in session. And that was sort of purposeful to make it more difficult. And so the suffragists had to convince 30 governors to call their uh, legislators back into special session to consider the amendment. And many were reluctant to do this the, the, it was expensive. It put them in some political jeopardy because other things might come up in the special session that they didn't want to deal with. Um, the suffragists say, we'll, we'll serve as your chauffeurs. We'll serve as your um, secretaries because they say it, you know, governors are using the, the idea that it's too expensive to pay per diems. Anyway, there's all kinds of excuses um, and it makes it much more difficult. But that's the situation of the federal amendment, it for a long time, it's in what's called the doldrums. It doesn't even come up in the early part of the 20th century. It doesn't even come up for this, for uh, committee debate. And Alice Paul, who breaks off from the mainstream suffrage organization, 
uh, and around 1915, um, makes it her uh, the, the the centerpiece of her her uh, organization that they're going to revive the the uh, constitutional amendment and they're going to demand it. They're no longer asking for it. Their banners say, "We demand a, a, an amendment to the Constitution for women's vote." So if Alice Paul is a name that people should know from this second generation as someone who broke off and became even more radicalized, who are some of the other names of the second generation that people should know about? Well, I would say that there's actually three generations involved. So you have the the first ones who uh, enter the movement in the mid-19th century. Then you have another group that comes to the fore in the 1880s, 1890s, first part of the 20th century. And and that includes some very important names like Carrie Chapman Catt, who is a uh, protege to Susan Anthony. She uh, And she's chosen by Susan, Susan Anthony to lead the movement into the 20th century. There's Anna Howard Shaw, who also becomes a president of the, of the mainstream suffrage organization, the largest one, the National American. Um, and so you, you have that second generation. And then I would put Alice Paul, who's only in her early 30s in 1920, um, in the third generation. And the third generation emerges uh, in that second decade of the 20th century and says, OK, we're, we're done with waiting. We are no longer going to be polite. We are no longer going to ask uh, for the vote. We're no longer going to be ladylike about this and polite. We're going to be confrontational. We are going to be in the face of the congressman and the president. We will embarrass them if necessary. And we will carry on a public spectacle and and rattle the, the the cages and make sure everyone knows how American women are being betrayed by Congress, be, betrayed by politicians, and we're going to demand the vote. And so they are seen as insurgents. Uh, the mainstream suff- suffragists are not happy about this. They do not approve of their methods, these confrontational methods, which are imported from Great Britain, where they've been uh, used uh, and these include uh, now in Great Britain they're actually militant in that there there are bombs and there's uh, arson and there's all kinds of very nasty things um, done by the suffragists there. In America, it's really demonstrations, but demonstrations in a way that has never been used. There's been marches for years, and in fact, Alice Paul has staged this unbelievably large. Uh, national suffrage parade in Washington in 1913 on the day before Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. But now they're going to revert to far more confrontational methods, such as picketing, picketing the White House, never been done before. And here are women standing in front of the White House day and night and um, and in all weather, with picket signs saying, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? And during World War I saying, democracy begins at home. How can we be fighting a war to make the world safe for democracy when half of our nation doesn't have a voice in their own democracy? So they are being far more confrontational. They're considered unpatriotic and perhaps even treasonous um, by many Americans. The mainstream suffragists in the uh, Carrie Cat and the National are very nervous about um, having these kind of tactics. Much like today, you the there is an element of the movement that does not want to um, be portrayed as too radical, as uh, violent. They see it as as being. A, a, actually holding them back of, of making enemies for their movement. And we, we still go through that. And of course, movements go through this regularly. We see this kind of schism over uh, tactics in almost every long-term social and political movement. It happens in the labor movement where the wobblies come up and say, we're not going to be 
you know, we're going to be violent about this. It happens in the civil rights movement, of course, we know, later in the 20th century. It happens in the gay rights movement. And so it's, it's not unusual for a long-term movement to split like this. And that's what happened with Alice Paul. And she and Carrie Catt uh, in 1920 are the leaders of the rival women's suffrage organizations. Carrie Catt's National American, much bigger, uh, claiming 2 million members. Um, Alice Paul's Women's Party, much smaller, um, but very vital. When the women were staging these demonstrations, uh, were they putting their lives in danger? What was the public reaction to their public protests? Yes, they were. Now, from the very beginning, there was violence. Um, Susan Anthony and Stanton and Lucy Stone were all pelted with rotten eggs and spoiled vegetables. In fact, uh, Susan um, Susan Anthony, who was the great organizer and traveled the country back and forth every year, uh, used to say she could mark the progress of the movement by the kind of projectiles that were thrown at her. So when they were no longer rotten eggs, just kind of plain old eggs, well, that was progress. Um, so they are, they, they're attacked by uh, gangs of angry men and boys all the time. They are thrown from their uh, floats in parades, their banners are, are uh, accosted and ripped in half, their clothes are ripped. So they were used to a certain amount of, um, of violence. But once this picketing begins, and once President Woodrow Wilson, uh, who is very embarrassed by this in front of the White House, uh, and they are also in Lafayette Park, and of course, just this summer, we saw protesters in Lafayette Park be arrested. Um, and all I could think of was, wow, that's just how the suffragists were arrested in Lafayette Park for demonstrating and only exercising their First Amendment rights of assembly. But these uh, Women's Party suffragists are arrested uh, on really bogus uh, legal, legal uh, standing, things like obstructing the sidewalk. Well, they, you know, it's a broad sidewalk in front of the White House. Or lighting lighting a match after, uh, after sunset. That was one of my favorites. And they're hauled into, um, into jail. And they're, they refuse bail for the most part. And so they're imprisoned in these horrible uh, jails in, in D.C. and also in Virginia. And they're rat infested, they're cold, they're, they're given moldy bread. They are actually um, tortured and accosted and um, assaulted by the prison personnel. Uh, there's, there's something called the Night of Terror, where um, they are truly, truly abused in the prison. They go on hunger strike and they are um, force fed with tubes rammed down their noses. Many of the women are uh, do collapse, and there are very poignant pictures in the Library of Congress of women being uh, released from jail, and they cannot even walk. They're so weak. Um, they, Alice Paul herself is put in solitary confinement, and she's threatened with being um, committed to a mental institution. So, yes, they did put their lives on, their, on the line. 168 women went to jail during this period of time. What was the news coverage like? What was the public reaction to the, the stories of these women being subjected to uh, this kind of punishment for speaking up? Well, it's very interesting. The um, Wilson administration, in collaboration, I should say, with Carrie Catt and the National Association, the mainstream suffrage group, actually called in newspaper editors and said, you know, don't give this radical group too much play in the newspaper. You know, you're, you're playing into their hands. It's almost the way we talk about giving coverage to terrorists. And they did consider these women terrorists. And so they, there was a literally a, a cabal uh, to not cover them very much. But after the 1913 uh, uh, parade in Washington, which is attacked by by men and boys viciously. Um, there is there is coverage 
uh, the, the silent sentinels are covered in, in some newspapers. Remember, even at this time, even in 1920, a lot of suffrage news appears <laughs> in, on the women's pages, along with recipes and uh, notices about the local bridge club. Uh, yeah, it was really shocking to see that they were still being covered there. Um, so the coverage is very, um, uh, of, you know, conflicting. It it shows them being arrested, but it almost says they deserve it because look what they're doing. They're embarrassing the president. They're embarrassing the Congress. And so um, you see this, but then you also see a revulsion against the uh, harsh treatment. You know, it's one thing to arrest someone, perhaps even if it's illegal uh, and they're just exercising their, their First Amendment rights. It's another to torture them and put them in prison for months. I mean, the, the, their uh, prison terms were six, nine months. And so there is, there does begin to be a revulsion, both in the newspapers and in the public. Uh, and in 1919, when um, the suffragists had finally been released from prison, because it's getting, only because it's getting too embarrassing for President Wilson to, to have this, uh, in the papers anymore, they are they are released and they go on this amazing public relations uh, foray where they it's called the prison special train. They rent a Pullman car, which is pulled across the country on, on a northern route and then on a southern route, and it's packed with twenty eight suffragists from young women to grandmothers, all of whom have been in prison. Uh, for for demonstrating for suffrage. And they go across the country, they stop in every city, and they hold rallies, they hold um, marches, they hold um, all kinds of outdoor uh, speeches. And they say, we're your mothers, we're your grandmothers, we're your daughters and sisters. And we have been imprisoned and tortured for asking for the right to vote in America. And this also begins to get the public uh, uncomfortable about just what is, you know, why are they being treated like this? And I think it helps to convince Congress that they can't sit on this amendment any longer. You, so talked, oh, you talked earlier about the many cross currents in American society uh, during that period of time. Uh, one of those, 1920, was the rise of the Lost Cause movement and the rise of the KKK, there were black suffragist movements. Did the white women's groups welcome them into the ranks or, or did they work separately? Yeah, it's, it, that is a fascinating and complicated and in the end disappointing uh, uh, chapter in, in the whole movement. The, the, the nation was severely segregated and we have to understand that that's how the world was at the time. That doesn't excuse the suffragists. The suffragists had to convince uh, quite a number of racist white men in Congress from the Southern states and from a few other states too, but mostly from the Southern states. They had to get a large segment of them to uh, vote yes to, rat to um, pass the federal amendment. And so they used arguments and then they would have to go back to them in in their in state legislatures. And so they used arguments that really should make us wince today. But in the political scheme of things at the time was uh, uh, convenient for the suffragists. And that was arguments like, well, you know, don't worry that this is going to upset the apple cart. Because the federal amendment does give the right to vote to all women black and white. Um, and so they're saying, you know, there are more white women in the South than black women. So don't worry. It's not going to, it's just going to double the white vote. Um, they also try to distance themselves from the black suffragists, the black women who have been organizing in every city, in every town. They, the black women understand the importance of the vote. They've seen their men who are guaranteed the vote with the 15th Amendment be, be robbed of the right to vote by Jim Crow laws. And so 
they feel an even more visceral need to obtain the vote. And they're working in every city. That it, what's wonderful about the centennial is that it has spurred more research uh, into what black women suffragists were doing because they were not, for the most part, uh, with rare exception, allowed into the white establishment of suffrage organizations because society was segregated. And so for the most part, they had to uh, form their own. And so you see black women organizing through the um, black women's clubs, uh, through church groups, through social uplift groups of the time. And so you see these black suffragists very, very um, energized and very engaged in this, but they have to work on it separately for the most part. Um, And you see the white suffragists time and again putting a distance, knowing how important it is uh, to make sure black women are also on board for this, but still keeping their distance so that they can mollify both Southern women who do not really want black women to vote. And of course the Southern men. And so you, you do see this um, uh, terrible, uh, uh, forced split between what the white suffragists are doing and the black suffragists. But there are there are black suffragists involved uh, on, on in the, some of the higher levels, you know, the national level of the uh, of the movement. For the most part, they are kept at a distance. We have about uh, 12 minutes left with with you in this hour on the women's suffrage centennial. So what tipped the scales for President Woodrow Wilson? Why did he decide to reverse himself and support it? Well, Woodrow Wilson, (laughs) um, he spent most of his life greatly opposed to the idea of women's suffrage. And time and again, he he expresses this. Uh, remember, he has a whole career as uh, the president of Princeton. Then he is governor of New Jersey, and then he is president. And so, when he's president, um, again, Alice Paul has um, organized this unbelievably large, like eight thousand women marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in March of 1913. And the next day. They are asking for a meeting at the White House, and they bombard him for for weeks and months afterwards, for years afterwards. And he just he just puts them off and says, "You know, I've never really thought about suffrage, um, or I can't do anything because uh, I have to wait for my party, the Democratic Party, to uh, decide what to do." I and mean, he he uses enor- many many um, excuses. What happens? when America enters the World War is there's a bit of a shift. Partly, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt, the president of the National American Association, the largest mainstream group, who is a pacifist herself and who uh, formed the Women's Peace Party just a few years before, makes a political and moral compromise that she cannot impose her personal I, uh, philosophy on the movement and that although she hopes that when women can vote, they will outlaw war. That is really one of her goals for the suffrage movement. She sees that they cannot sit on the sidelines during this, you know, the first really modern cataclysmic war. And she decides to pledge the the uh, loyalty and the work of the members of her organization to the war effort. And this is a big get for President Wilson. And he is very um, grateful for it. Alice Paul refuses to support the war. She has her picketers out there saying, um, how can we um, fight this war for democracy when you are not giving women democracy at home? And so you have this kind of good cop, bad cop between Carrie Catt and her approach to Wilson and Alice Paul's. What happens also is that um, Woodrow Wilson, as the war closes in November of 1918, early 1919, just when the suffrage amendment is coming to a to a head in Congress, he's trying to get uh, the League of Nations passed by 
Congress. He wants this to be his legacy, that there will be an international organization that will prevent the kind of horrible war that the world has just gone through. And so he sees women who he, he, I think, evaluates and says women care more about peace. They know what war is like. They've lived through this horrible experience very recently. They will support the League of Nations. They will push their senators and congressmen if they can vote. And so he comes around partly out of that political calculation that um, – if his legacy is to be um, established at all as a peacemaker and not just a war president, then he needs women to be able to vote. And so you see him very slowly and again under pressure from Carrie Catt and the mainstream suffragists and under embarrassment from Alice Paul, slowly reverse. But it, it is a political, um, it's also a political calculation he makes. So we started out with the dramatic story of the vote in Tennessee that put the amendment over the top. It became officially part of the Constitution on August 26th. Uh, tell me about Election Day in 1920. How many women were able to vote and how many really turned out? Yeah, so when the amendment enters the Constitution on August 26th, it's ratified on August 18th in Tennessee, 27 million women are eligible to vote. Now this does not, this does include African American women. It does not include Native American women. They are not considered citizens at that time. And it doesn't include Asian American women because they are also not considered citizens in 1920. And it, like African Americans, it will take decades more for them to win the right to vote. What happens is there's 27 million women are eligible, but only about 10 million actually vote in the 1920 election. And ironically, they give a landslide victory. They help to give a landslide victory to the Republican presidential candidate, Warren Harding, who not known very much at the time was a womanizer and was also tended towards allowing his cronies uh, to um, run free and run a corrupt administration. And that's what he's known for now. But they give him, he looked presidential, they gave him the vote. What happened, though, is that so now only, um, you know, one out of three eligible women has gone to the polls. And the press goes to Carrie Catt and says, so you were working on this for, what, seven decades? What happened? Why aren't all women running to vote? And, and she explains it and says, you know, voting is a learned habit. You have to learn to get in the groove that you vote in every election. And women don't have that. They have it in a few states and it's only, it's, it's very new to them. Uh, even in New York, they'd never voted in presidential election before. And so she says they'll learn it. And one of the things she does to help them learn it is she establishes the League of Women Voters uh, to teach women how to study the issues, study the candidates. And that is also celebrating its centennial anniversary uh, this year. Um, that said, I've thought about why only only 10 million women. And, and I came up with a few answers. One is that even though it's now legal to vote in a lot of your hometown, it might not be accepted. Your pastor might still be railing from the pulpit about how this is going to bring down the American home, your garden club colleagues may not really have been um, uh, supporters of suffrage. It's still, uh, your, your family may still not uh, approve of you voting. And so it still takes a bit of courage and nerve and um, unsettling uh, uh, move out of your comfort zone to stand at the polling place and vote. So I think you have that going on. It's also just 10 weeks from election, from the time it enters the Constitution to Election Day. And quite a few states are, uh, did not extend their registration um, deadlines. In Georgia, they refused to extend uh, registration and did not allow any women to vote because they didn't want black women to vote. What we'll also we'll see happen on Election Day is that the beginning of the suppression of black women's vote begins right then and there. 
And there are some horrible incidents in, in Florida where uh, women who try to vote are, are attacked and there are some lynchings. And we begin to see how in the South the 19th Amendment will be subverted and undermined by the Jim Crow laws of um, literacy tests and poll taxes and intimidation and violence. And that will hold, that will prevent many black women, not all, in the South. Again, they are voting in the in other parts of the country, African Americans, but the population is centered, still centered in the South. The Great Migration has just begun. And so they the Southern states will use these very vicious um, Jim Crow laws to undermine the 19th Amendment. And Congress, which has the power to enforce the 19th Amendment, will never um, step in and enforce it until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 puts some uh, legal teeth into enforcement. So as we close out our hour together, how should we as Americans think of the suffragists and their contribution to American history? Well, I think the way to look at the suffragists, and they, they are an incredible group. And I, I, again, they had many male allies, but I'll talk about the women. They were grassroots activists at every level. Um, they were teachers, they were nurses, uh, they were secretaries, they were factory workers, they were of all races. Um, and they worked to right injustice over three generations, over 70 years. And of course, for uh, quite a few of these women, that fight would continue. And so I think we need to see the, their persistence, their creativity, their ability to, to use both protest and demonstration, but also uh, very savvy political tools. They become master politicians. They become orators. They become campaigners. They are lobbying in Congress at a very, very high level and, and in the White House. So they, they master both protest and political tools. And I think we need to look at that as a, a blueprint for social and political protest today. You know, there's protests in, um, around the country right now. And how do you uh, mobilize and marshal the political strategy. So you have to have both, and you have to have a very um, sustained political strategy for how you're going to get very specific goals. Uh, the suffragists narrowed their broad agenda of women's rights into women's suffrage. Now, some say that's a, that's a mistake. They should have been fighting on a broader level, and that could be. But I think it does give us a, a very interesting uh, look at a movement that had to persist over three decades and 70 years, and by some counts, 900 campaigns at the state, local, and national level. But I think it also teaches us that our democracy is always having to be tested and improved. And we're at a moment right now when voting rights is a critical, critical problem. And many states have uh, taken advantage of the gutting of the Voting Rights Act uh, in, in 2013 by the Supreme Court ruling. And they have installed onerous uh, voter restriction laws. And I think we need to stand up and say, as the suffragists did, as the civil rights uh, movement uh, leaders and, and whole uh, millions and millions who, who worked for civil rights in, in the 1960s, we have to go back into the trenches. We have to protect a citizen's right to vote. And so I think it gives us both an appreciation how these women uh, were able to create a movement when there was no mass media. You know, they didn't have Facebook to organize. Um, and yet they organize all over the nation over a long period of time. Uh, we hope it doesn't take that long, but we, we see how, how necessary it is to build alliances, to, um, to be strategic and to be nimble. you got to have Plan B and Plan C. And the suffragists were defeated more often than they succeeded. But they kept at it. And I think that's uh, a good lesson. And the, the lesson of the 
uh, importance of fighting for voting rights, perhaps every generation has to stand up for it. And we're at that moment where we have to stand up for it right now. The book is called The Woman's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Votes. Elaine Weiss, thank you very much for telling us the story of the 19th Amendment and the long fight to enact it in our Constitution. Thank you so much, Susan. Pleasure to be with you. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org with your questions, comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.